then we will return to session. Um, and um, I'm going to go to Ms. Norton. Uh, Mr. Marshall hasn't gotten back yet. And we'll just go to uh, Ms. Norton for her question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think it's a very important bill. Um, and one that you have uh, done the kind of oversight that is respected before changes are made and existing legislation. Um, I don't have a, a, a great many questions for these witnesses, however. Um, I'd like to just say a word about the COLA adjustment, which has come up time and again in, in our hearings. Um, I saw the, the Appropriation Committee of the Defense Department um, adjust the COLA for GOD employees, some of whom, for various reasons, were captured by the same problems because of the um, new pay uh, system as the GAO employees. So guess what? They went to one of the most powerful committees, uh, uh, subcommittees in the Appropriation Committee, and they got their COLA. I want to know um, if you see uh, any justification. I indicated when we were discussing um, the changes that I had recommended for this bill to equate the kinds of, uh, of independence that the appointing authority has in the executive branch with the kind of authority that the speaker and uh, and the minority ought to have here and in the Senate. I, I must say that I don't, uniformity for its own sake doesn't work with me, uh, but inequality doesn't work either. There are good reasons sometimes for changes, and if they are justified, then of course, it seems to me if they're functionally justified, they should occur. Looking to the COLA, uh, would either of you see any adjust any justification uh, for making people who do not receive their COLA in the years that uh, have been acknowledged without at the same time making these employees whole for the entire period? I mean, could that possibly be justified? Um, In other words, yeah. could you get a little bit pregnant? Well. If you concede <laughs> that you must make them whole or for a couple of years, <laughs> aren't you already pregnant? <laughs> Go ahead and have the baby. Uh, uh, with, with regard to the uh, 2006-2007 situation, you know, we think we've worked with subcommittee staff and have come up with a, a really reasoned and practical approach for providing the, the uh, cost of living adjustment to those employees who did not receive the cost of living adjustment at that time. Uh, that would be provided in a lump sum payment to them as well as their salaries adjusted uh, going forward and, and so they would, their salaries would be brought up to the level going forward that, uh, uh, you know, they would have been assuming they had received those adjustments. So we, we think that's a, a reasonable. Excuse me. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Don't. Because <laughs> yeah. re reasonable people can disagree on what's, uh, what's, what's, what's reasonable. I just want to make sure we have in the record whatever justification is appropriate. Now. 2006 and 2007, you believe, are appropriate? Yes. You believe they are reasonable? Yes. That being the case, why is it not appropriate to make these employees whole for the entire period? I can understand you right. may be limited right. in what you can do. If that's your answer, I would understand that. Uh, but is there any justification for not making these employees whole for the years, the 
that they did not receive their COLA if they should have received them right. for the two years that you believe uh, clearly they should have. Yeah. I'm looking for justification. Yeah, right, I'm not looking right. for what was reasonable. Right. Um, I'm uh, looking for why it was reasonable right. or why it is reasonable if you think it is to deny them their COLAs for the years that preceded it. It may have seemed reasonable at the time. I'm now right. saying, that's right. why I said, at this moment in time, right. Right. could the Congress possibly justify giving the back COLA for two years? And by the way, isn't this a part of the uh, pension? Is a COLA included in the pension? Your COLA is part of your, your wages, including your pension. So you understand what I'm talking about here. Right. We're not talking just right. about people's salaries. We're talking right. about uh, their pensions as well. We understand their base pay. Right. So I'm saying that considered, what is the justification? I'm not saying at the time there may have seemed justification. Right. Right. This point in time, people get two years. Is there any justification for saying you can have it for two years, but you cannot have it? for the period, the entire period, that you were denied your COLA. And if so, I want to hear the justification specifically, mm -hmm. not that it was reasonable. If it seemed, your justification is it seemed reasonable at the time, we understand right. the difference, fine. What, is, what would be the justification now for making people partially whole? Uh, um, uh, Mrs. Norton, maybe I could take a, a, a crack at this. When we've considered these two uh, issues of uh, dealing with the past and the uh, pay decisions uh, that were made with respect to 06 and 07, uh, as Jean mentioned before, we want to prospectively adjust their salary and we want to give them a lump sum. The three principles that we brought to bear as we were talking with uh, uh, internally and with staff about how to approach this is that we wanted to uh, one, have something that budgetarily we can afford. Secondly, that there it's administratively doable and not overly burdensome. And third, that it is fair. Now, we have structured a proposal which, um, you know, in an ideal sense, it may, not be, it may not be everything that everybody wants in every detail, but we think on balance it's a very fair proposal, um, and it also deals with the um, retirement issue too, uh, through directions to uh, OPM to include the, the prospective pay adjustments in the uh, our employees high three going forward. I hope that helps. Uh, according to the staff memo, um, what we are doing is authorizing, seeks to provide an appropriate room for those employees who were denied all or part of their annual adjustment for 2006 and 2007 uh, or both years. Are those the only years? The, per yes, perhaps that makes yes, them whole. Yeah, those, right. are the only, those are the only two years. Right. Th th this takes care of everything in the past. Thank you, sir. <laughs> yeah, yeah, prior to that, Congresswoman, I'm sorry, I didn't understand e either. In, in, in basically up to 2005, we were giving the same across the board as the executive branch. We so it was didn't only for those years? Only for those years, and the floor guarantee provision we're seeking that's also included the in what? there, uh, it's a floor guarantee going forward. Yes. That would take care of the issue going forward as well. We're hoping to never talk about this issue <laughs> ag again. Talk uh, about putting an issue to rest. Yes, yes, that is our objective. All right, so we are fully pregnant, yes. the baby has been born. All right. yes. <laughs> uh, thank you very much. I, I, I was as, confused as, on the As Ms. Shan has pointed out to me, I'm not able to do that. <laughs> <laughs> but, 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 I, but I am able to be empathetic and I can try. Well, like, like ever, every father, you all were very necessary. <laughs> <laughs> if you want to cut off these metaphors, I'm perfectly willing to <laughs> I, I enjoy <laughs> the part of me that still that still teaches law. I, I enjoyed our conversation on uh, on um, the the uh, effort 
uh, I'm seeking in, in the chairman's bill to equate what happens in the executive agencies with, with GAO as well. And there was some thought that maybe there were some agencies, smaller agencies, where you, you the agency head uh, may appoint the uh, IG. Perhaps that is the case. <laughs> Um, I must say I'm familiar with many uh, agencies having headed one myself and am aware of no agency of any consequence <laughs> where Congress hasn't appointed a GAO and I may be because Congress looks at the size and importance of the agencies to public policy. Sure, it wouldn't be the size alone uh, because agencies differ vastly in size. Um, but I, I do want to get on the record that uh, in terms of, of the kinds of work the GAO does, um, which depends upon your independence, uh, would you believe that for an agency where um, of consequence whose policy concerns were of importance to the public that an independent IG would, would, would help its or assist it in being credible to the Congress of the United States and to the general public? We definitely support the IG concept and the principle uh, and we're prepared to ha have ourselves held to the same standards as any other agency. Uh, and we believe firmly in that process. I mean, that, that is why we've had an, an inspector general created administratively for over a decade. So we, we have voluntarily put that system in place the way we have for many management uh, principles and, and laws that are applied to the executive branch that don't normally apply to the legislative branch or, or GAO. And so we're very committed to that. I mean, we have put forth the statutory IG provision in, in our bill in an attempt to further enhance the independence and autonomy of that position. And, uh, you know, we're willing to entertain, uh, you know, discussions about the best way to appoint that person to have credibility. You know, the only, uh, there are only uh, one political appointees, maybe two in GAO altogether. One's the controller general position, which the Congress creates a list of at least three people with a congressional commission, sends names to the president, the president can ask for additional names, but has to pick from that, from that list. Now that's different, you know, because we're in the legislative branch than it would be for a, just the president to pick somebody on their own for a presidential appointee in a legislative branch agency. So there are differences. The only other political appointed position in GAO has been the Deputy Controller General, and that's been vacant for a while because that has not worked. Uh, that process hasn't worked. And while we were originally seeking to change that process with this legislative proposal, given the departure of Mr. Walker, we're, we think those things ought to be held in abeyance for a while. So. And uh, Mrs. Norton, um, I, w I would be happy to supply the committee for the record the list of uh, uh, the entities in the executive branch, I don't want to pass judgment on whether they are or are not of any consequence at this moment, uh, where the heads of the agencies appoint the IG. In the legislative branch, uh, the architect of the Capitol, the librarian of Congress, and um, I believe the public printer all uh, appoint the um, inspector generals in their institution. And, and I'm certainly open to having consultation with our oversight committees as, as part of this process. I mean, I think that just makes sense so that you have confidence in that individual. Well, I certainly want to c uh, commend the um, GAO for understanding <laughs> that when Congress hadn't appointed one, at the very least, uh, uh, he should appoint one. And I do want to indicate, I certainly have seen nothing to indicate that the lack of, of, of formal independence has affected the PAB or has affected the IG or has affected the Controller General. I really have not. As I indicated to you, I'm sick and tired of Congress waiting until <laughs> something happens before it then runs to, to do the obvious. Uh, that, 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 that really is all I'm about because Chairman was doing a number of other things in the bill. You don't just 
cute bills through here that seem uh, uh, the, the, the appropriate time. I certainly don't think the <laughs> far be it for me to say the architect and the Capitol, <laughs> Library of Congress and the public printer are not agencies of consequence, but you will forgive me if I do not equate them with the General Accounting Office, which then gets to pass judgment on everybody in the <laughs> United States government, much to their uh, displeasure, because whenever there's a GAO talking about you, it normally isn't saying anything you want to hear. So, <laughs> so, so I, I, I must say, if those are, are, are the agencies, they tend to prove my, my point, that, the, that um, I, 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 my own sense is that the member of Congress uh, want to want to acquire things of, of their constituents, we have an office of compliance. And it says we're going to apply the same laws to ourselves. If uh, those of us who, who sit in, in stations of power of one kind or the other are most vulnerable, terribly vulnerable, if in fact we don't live up to the same standards or structure ourselves by the same standards. So without, it, without meeting, in fact, finding, uh, sat in hearings and heard the general counsel uh, testify about the employee matters. That seemed to me to be a straight up and down counsel who looked at the law and just called it as she saw it. So I, the last thing I'm saying is that I see some evidence, but I have to tell you, I, this this committee is part of oversight and reform. And <laughs> it, 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 the reason that we have oversight and reform, a whole committee on that, uh, largest committee in the House, is, is precisely because um, there are so many things that blow up. And then it is our job to look at why it blew up. And then to say, why in the world didn't somebody do something about it? The reason is it wasn't broken. It wasn't broken. And, uh, in the global economy, in the, the United States better figure out this is not a world of ours any longer. This is not about economics, but it is about the habit of the Congress of saying, um, unless it's broken, we aren't doing anything about it. So I would like to do something about it this time, and I thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Ms. Norton. Uh, gentlemen, I think that concludes our questions for you, so thank you very much. And we appreciate your being here. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We will now go to our second panel for the afternoon. Panel two is Mr. Paul Coran. He is the chairman of the GAO's Personnel Appeals Board. The Personnel Appeals Board adjudicates personnel disputes involving employees or applicants to GAO as well as monitors equal employment opportunities at GAO. Ms. Ann Wagner is the general counsel for GAO's Personnel Appeals Board. And I see that you're both standing, so I'll just stand with you and administer the oath. Do you solemnly swear that the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? The record will show that the witness is answered in the affirmative. Thank you both for coming, and thank you for both for being here. Uh, Mr. Coran, we'll begin with you. You've got five minutes to summarize your uh, testimony, uh, the yellow light indicates that you're down to four, and of course the red light means that we've exhausted the time. Thank you very much, and you may begin. Yeah. There you go. Oh, too loud. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Chairman Davis and, and Representative Norton. Uh, I'm Paul Corrin. I served on the Personnel Appeals Board since uh, January of 2005, and I've been its chair since September of 2007. 
I'm honored to be here today before you to share my impressions of the board structure and processes. The PAB is, a, is charged with all of the investigatory and adjudicatory functions of the MSPB, the EEOC, the Office of Special Counsel, and the FLRA. As an adjudicatory body, the PAB must be independent, impartial, informed, effective, and efficient. The Congress and GAO's employees and managers are entitled to no less. One might ask how the PAB may entertain such broad jurisdiction, exist in the GAO structure, and yet maintain strict standards of an adjudicatory body. The answer is that in creating the PAB, Congress was very careful to design the board, its jurisdiction and structure in a way that would maintain the requisite independence and be both efficient and effective. I believe that the PAB is structured to and has consistently performed its statutory mission very well by providing a just forum for re resolution of employment disputes and by providing independent oversight of equal employment opportunity at GAO for nearly 30 years. My perspective, I derived from uh, serving a term in the uh, uh, so-called School of Hard Knocks. Before joining the PAB, I served for 36 years in federal employment and labor law capacities in both the executive and legislative branches. As a neutral with the NLRB, the Department of Labor, the old Federal Labor Relations Council, and the Office of Compliance, and I served in advocate roles at two ends of the pole, as a president of a local labor organization and as a management attorney with the Department of State. These experiences allowed me to observe and participate before an array of federal sector employment adjudication agencies with government-wide jurisdiction. I've also had the opportunity to observe and participate before boards which are limited uh, to the executive branch foreign affairs agencies. In preparing for today, I reviewed the excerpts from last year's hearing and noted Representative Norton's concerns about board members' independence, in particular, how they are appointed. I would like to address those concerns. The PAB's independence goes well beyond its separate physical location in a building closer to Capitol Hill than it is to GAO. It goes beyond its complete freedom to create its own personality, such as in its own report covers not having the iconic GAO blue covers. It goes beyond its ability to keep its employees in the GS, GS general schedule pay system while the rest of GAO became pay banded. It goes beyond the fact that the PAB has its own logo, logo and its own website. In my three years with the PAB, I've had no reason to conclude anything but that my colleagues and I serve as totally free agents in meeting our statutory responsibility. As part of the GAO, we enjoy the ex excellent logistical resources that GAO provides us for our administrative needs. In prior service, I've seen a small freestanding agency overburdened with having to provide for nearly all of its administrative needs. I am grateful that we are not so diverted from our mission. At the same time, our autonomy evokes the sense of actual separateness throughout our staff and through the board. I recognize that the appearance of independence can be as important as the actuality. While the Comptroller General appoints the PAB members, that act is the result of a nearly year-long collegial process. I'm, I'm running short on time. I want to summarize that process just by saying that the process is exhausting. Em employees and their involvement is integrated throughout the process. And, at, uh, and the Comptroller General may appoint the, uh, the members, but it's only uh, after this careful vetting process. Uh, I'm sorry that I've, I've gone past my time. Go right I, ahead. I've, yes? You can finish that. Oh, okay. Uh, I, I'd like to point out the people with whom I serve, uh, which is a, a, a indicative of uh, uh, the quality of uh, appointments through this process. 
they all, and throughout the his history of the uh, board, they have all been uh, labor and employment law specialists. Uh, some have represented uh, management, some have been employee advocates, uh, some have been neutrals. Uh, I myself have moved uh, across those, those roles. But I've never worked with anyone on the board uh, who would ever serve in a situation where doctrinaire policies uh, govern rather than applying the rule of law and equity to cases on individual uh, uh, basis. Uh, I, I do believe that the, uh, the board has fulfilled its function through its uh, decisions and its oversight on EEO matters throughout its uh, almost uh, 30 years of existence. And I would be pleased to answer any questions the committee may have. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Wagner. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, good afternoon. Good afternoon, uh, Mrs. Norton. I'm here at your request, uh, Mr. Davis, to answer your questions concerning the Office of General Counsel's uh, investigations into a number of charges that have been filed uh, with the PAB uh, General Counsel's Office dealing with GAO's pay system. As a preliminary matter, I would just like to uh, reiterate what I had stated in my previous testimony before the subcommittee that the um, the the PAB General Counsel, by statute and regulation, conducts investigations into charges that are brought before it in order to make a reasonable grounds determination as to whether a violation has been committed, and if so, to offer representation to the charging party to adjudicate that claim before the Personnel Appeals Board. Uh, therefore, the entire thrust of our investigation is really directed at determining whether that offer of legal representation is to be made. The, ultimate decision making with regard to those claims is of course uh, statutorily committed to the Personnel Appeals Board itself which uh, makes findings of facts and draws conclusions of law with regard to the claims. The, with regard to the status of the investigations, I would point out that there were 274 charges that were filed in toto uh, dealing with various aspects of the JO pay system. Um, these charges can generally be characterized as having challenged uh, the market-based pay system that was established at GAO, the elimination of the 2006 and 2007 annual adjustment, uh, otherwise known as a COLA. The charges also raise the question as to, uh, or raise claims as to the deviation of the GAO COLA in 2006 and 2007 from that which was accorded the uh, executive branch employees under the GS schedule. Some of these charges also challenge the use of a standardized rating score in uh, calculating the performance-based performance compensation that's afforded uh, employees at GAO. In addition, some of these charges dealt with the calculation of locality pay, the use of a speed bump uh, with regard to some of the band level pay ranges, the lack of uniformity in the rating system across the teams at GAO, as well as uh, some challenge to the band two restructuring decisions. In addition, there were 14 individuals who challenged the pay decisions uh, based on uh, claims of discrimination. That is, some of them have alleged that the pay decisions were unlawful uh, based on discrimination due to age, race, as well as sexual orientation. Since these charges have been filed, eight individuals have withdrawn, which has left us with 266 charges currently pending in our office in investigation. Our office has not completed its investigation and I am particularly sensitive at this point to um, enter into any public disclosure with regard to our preliminary assessment as to the merits of any or all of those claims. However, the question as to the Comptroller General's statutory authority to eliminate the COLA entirely in 2006 and 2007 was a question that was raised as, bar as part of the Band 2 restructuring cases that my office handled last year, which settled and, and which was the basis of the testimony that I gave last year. So I do feel, uh, uh, I don't feel constrained with regard to um, uh, any uh, issues of confidentiality in discussing that issue with you today. Uh, my uh, determination with regard to the statutory authority question has not changed since last year. I do believe that the plain language as well as the legislative history of Public Law 108-271 uh, manifestly supports the conclusion that the Comptroller General lacked statutory authority to eliminate the COLA entirely. 
Um, that said, and with due regard for the rights of the employees whose claims are still pending uh, in our office and still under investigation, I'd be more than happy to answer any of the questions that you have with regard to the uh, cases that we're handling. Thank you very much, and thank both of you. Um, as you know, the subcommittee staff has been working on pay adjustment provisions for the FY6 and 7 for GAO, GAO employees who met expectations but did not receive an across-the-board adjustment for those years. What I'd like to know is uh, your views on the retroactive provision that I've included in the legislation that I will introduce to address the problem, and also your views on the across-the-board floor guarantee provision that will ensure that in future years, GAO employees will get the general schedule and your pay adjustment. Mr. Chairman, I um, have to, uh, say that I don't have a, I've not, it would be entirely speculative to, um, to pass uh, judgment or to address the questions directly. Um, I was given a, a draft uh, proposal, proposed language uh, Friday or Monday. Um, I raised concerns about uh, whether or not the language as, as it was given to me at that point would fully redress the claims with regard to the COLA. Um, I, I, I don't, I have not seen any subsequent revisions if in, in, in fact there have been, um, at that point, I, if there have been revisions, I certainly would be uh, happy to review that and, and um, provide you with my assessment as to whether that, you know, that would redress fully the claims concerning the COLA. All right. Um, let me ask you also, um, what drives, if you could, um, many of the appeals that, that you get? Many of the appeals that come before the board, I mean, what do you think actually drives them or causes the individuals to appeal? I think there are two aspects to that question. The first being what drives people to our office filing a charge and then what would compel them to take a case forward to the board. I think that um, in my short experience as the general counsel at the Personnel Appeals Board, um, I, I have seen that employees uniformly come to, to our office because they genuinely feel that they have somehow their rights have been violated or that they have been wronged in some way. If they can't articulate specifically how their rights have been violated, um, I, I find that perfectly understandable, it's, but it's genu genuinely that they feel that they've been wronged. After we have had an opportunity to do an investigation and to examine the factual and legal grounds for that their claim, they then have to step back and, and analyze whether there's a viability from a legal standpoint uh, in terms of going forward. That's assuming, you know, whether or not we offer to represent them or not. And at that point, I think that, uh, again, I, I can only speculate, but I suspect that, you know, the extent to which individuals take those cases forward or want to take them forward um, is probably a function of a number of factors, how strong the case is, how, how, what personal toll they anticipate this having on them. Do you feel that passage of the provision relative to the claims before the PAB that pertain to the denial of across the board increases for 06 and 07 would decrease uh, the number of appeals that would in all likelihood come before the board. 
again, without having the language to ha you know, having really reviewed the language um, that's maybe currently under consideration, if I if I could simply state more sort of broadly and gen generally, if the legislation that is being proposed plainly manifests congressional intent to make these individuals whole with regard to their annual pay adjustments, then I think it it the one could say that much of the, the relief that the em employees might have gotten through the adjudicative process would have been afforded them through the legislative process. Thank you very much. I have no further questions. Uh, Ms. Norton. Could, could I have your view if uh, a, a system may be used to determine uh, job-related matters? such as promotion, for example, uh, does that system uh, have to be validated? Uh, uh, Representative Norton, we, we only get it at the board level after it goes through the general counsel's investigative process. We, we get uh, live cases where the employee has exhausted the administrative process and is either the general counsel represents the employee if the employee accepts or else the employee comes forward. And uh, what, you're, what you're bringing up is a question of a possible uh, legal theory of a charge that someone may claim that the standards by which they were not uh, promoted uh, do not, they have an adverse impact uh, on a prescribed uh, basis and, and they haven't been validated. That, that could be a case we, that could properly be brought before the board and would have to be adjudicated uh, based yeah, on I the fact. I didn't ask you for the outcome. I asked you about the standard. I'm asking you whether the standard of validation of, of um, matters used for various uh, decisions in, in an employee's uh, um, work have to be validated. I'm not asking you for the outcome. Obviously, they have to show whether or not they're job related. I'm asking validated, of course, means job related. No. If, if I, uh, I would be, I'd be speaking just personally and not, not for the board, but for my uh, dealing in these cases, particularly at the State Department where there was women's class action, uh, where the written examination had an adverse effect on, on women and it couldn't be shown to be strictly job related, uh, the department settled that case because the, the, the matter hadn't been validated, and yes. Thank you. Ms. Wagner, I, isn't that the current state of the law that, that um, um, terms and conditions used for such matters as promotion, I just give a, a or a system of ratings, uh, you can name it, that that's subject to um, challenge uh, if in fact um, the entity could be a private employer or federal agency cannot validate the, uh, the use of the particular system. I, the question as to whether what, um, what factors must be taken into account with regard to uh, now don't answer another question because okay. I'm not even asking you. I, would, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't begin to ask you what factors. I'm asking you uh, a conclusion of law based on what I presume you understand about the existing case law. That's all Mr. Corrin gave me. He couldn't give me, in fact, uh, anything pertaining to a, uh, to, a, to a specific case. If I were to ask a Supreme Court justice, do you, <laughs> what it does, a conclusion of law, he, he could probably tell me that what the law is when applied to a specific fact. He couldn't tell me anything because you'd have to, you'd have to look at that set of circumstances. I'm simply asking whether uh, the factors uh, that an employer use, public or pri uses, public or private, uh, to make judgments about major aspects of a person's employment, such as promotion or how the, uh, the person is rating, you can, you can name it. I don't know what it is because I don't know what job I'm talking about yet. 
simply asking the bottom line question is, uh, would not that system have to be validated as a matter, of, does not the case law show that? The case law talks uh, specifically in terms of uh, a Title VII challenge, uh, in a, a Title VII challenge to a personal action. Y oftentimes, a, 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 a party will look to whether the factors were validated. I don't think that the law supports the concept that there's any one particular method for validating a particular system. And the reason, well, the only reason why I was talking that earlier core, is that I, 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 I right. will grant you that. Under the, I wouldn't, I wouldn't ask you about any of the specifics of validation. It's a very technical process. It varies from job to job. It's a very difficult process. I'm simply trying to to ask the bottom line question about validation itself. Yeah, I mean, I think that it would, it's reasonable to say that any decision, uh, it, it, whether it's a you know promotion or, or pay, would have to be a, a rise out of a system that's valid. Yeah, ha that, that's all I'm asking. Let, just let me understand, I understand uh, your role, Mr. Carr, and your role obviously is, is much like the uh, judic judicatory role of anybody of any of any similar body, for example, in the executive branch, um, where you sit in judgment and you wait uh, for uh, the specific cases to come before you. Could I ask whether the general counsel renders advice to anybody other than the PAB? Who renders advice to the controller general? The PAB general counsel does not render advice to the Comptroller General, and who, who uh, I, would, I, I would assume that the Office of General Counsel at GAO provides. Uh, so they have their own yes. general counsel. Yes. Um, could I ask you, um, uh, Ms. Wagner, I I think it is probably the case, and, and I can't find a way out of this. Apparently, 12 employees did file um, for the PAB and did get a remedy. And of course, that left everybody else out. Uh, and they didn't get a remedy. They hadn't filed. Um, that's why this action here has has been necessary to make those people who did not file whole. Um, is there anything? that could have been done so that we did not have to go <laughs> through this laborious process when there were 12 people who had shown for the class, for the class, that there was an error made and most of the class was left out <laughs> because they haven't filed. Now, obviously, we're in federal court. There's way to deal with those things. It's pretty formal, class actions and the like. But here you have this anomalous situation where the, the PAB had found, uh, I believe that, I believe you had argued, I believe you had argued that the Comptroller General lacked the authority uh, to deny the COLAs. I believe that the, the PAB found an if I can, to I'm that sorry. to, to that no. effect, and that as a result, twelve people who filed they settled before it went yes. to the PAB. Yeah. Yes, that's they. The, you those argued cases. and then they settled. Is that it? You you made the, the the you made the case that you believed he he the controller general lacked the authority. At that point, a settlement occurred. Is that how? It, the 12, if I can just address the, I, what I believe is the underlying concern, which is why this, the, the relief wasn't extended more broadly um, from the, the 12 to the rest of the uh, 308 individuals who were denied COLA in 2006. At the time that the 12 individuals, actually there were more, um, but the time those individuals filed, the case what they were challenging, the personnel decisions that they were challenging, had to do with the, the restructuring. It, they all arose out of the, the split 
of the Band 2 analyst and specialist workforce. That one of the effects of the split for some of those people was the elimination of their COLA because they, having been placed into Band 2A, they capped out and they therefore were denied a COLA. But the fundamental thrust of those cases was in all, then and remained throughout whether this restructuring process itself was valid and whether those individuals, I mean, assuming and, and ultimately the case, ultimately the, the, the decisions had to do with the per, whether those individuals were demoted. And the factors that were taken into account in that process with regard to whether those 12 individuals were demoted not only took into, not only involved sort of general policy decisions that the Comptroller General made, but ultimately came down to their performance. So that in assessing whether this was the type of case that would be amenable to a class action, I had to look at whether it was going to require individual evidentiary showings with regard to those each particular individual, and it just didn't strike me that that was going to be amenable to class action treatment. If the impact with regard to the COLA was in fact more broad-based, but the 12 cases that I had before me that we were investigating had to do with the demotions of 12 individuals. And again, I, it, was a, it was a judgment call with regard to whether ultimately those cases were going to be amenable to class certification because, it was, because the evidence was going to have to ultimately, in order to demonstrate that they should not have been demoted, if all of my theories about the, the policies were flawed or were wrong, then ultimately we were going to have to show that each of those people qualified to get into Band 2B. And so to do that, on a broad basis was going to be, was beyond the scope well, of, of what Well, of course, that may be the case, Ms. Wagner, but, but if the underlying issue was whether um, uh, the system itself was job-related, regardless of the individual differences in performance, those individual differences would have to have been judged by a job-related system for each aspect of their performance that was involved. Is that not, in fact, the case? There, th what was at issue there was whether the, their ratings over the last three year, the, the three-year period prior to the restructuring were legitimate reflections of their qualifications to remain in band 2B. The issue as to, yeah, I mean, it, it, there was an issue concerning, and we would have been prepared to challenge the rating system as such to show that these individuals' ratings did not accurately reflect their performance. I don't, it did not, the, the challenges that we were looking at were, again, specific to these particular individuals in that we were, we were looking at issues like did, you know, this individual's performance manager accurately capture that individual's performance during this period of time, as opposed to the sort of systemic issues that I think are implicated by your question. I just want to say for the record, uh, Ms. Wagner, your answer does not indicate that you're in touch with the um, complexity of validation cases. When somebody challenges um, the system for promoting, which is you know, a very simple-minded answer, but it's the way it's happened and where these, the, these uh, notions have been developed, in an entire corporation with hundreds of thousands of employees, the complaint will say these people up and down the corporation who are black, 
who are female, you name it, um, have systematically gotten performance rate ratings. There is a pattern of performance ratings pat reflected in pay, et cetera, uh, that is less than, let us say, white males. If you, if you want to see something complicated, much more complicated than 300 and some employees who you say you have to capture their individual job, <laughs> their performance on the job, their qualifications, that is precisely the, the, the nomenclature, the, the words that uh, describe validation cases. And the reason that employers go to all the trouble to validate is once you get into the morass of trying to explain differences the way you are, you're out of court. And so we have to understand it's very complicated here. This is, ra this is based on whether you're capturing everything they do and everything these women do is really different from what these men, hey, fine. The burden shifts to the employer and that is the point. The once you show statistically the difference, don't think that employers haven't been able, particularly with validated systems, to overcome this. But once you saw, show the difference, the burden shifts entirely to the employer because obviously the employee and its lawyer doesn't have the information. It's you who are saying these women are being paid equal to men. If you, if you knew all I knew, okay, fine, tell us what you know. All we've done is shift the burden to you. Now, the thing that troubles me about your answer is that if employees challenge uh, performance or rating systems from some other agency before, I don't know, the EOC or some such agency, MSBP, that system would be fully understood. So I'm bothered by the notion that, you know, that there are difference, there's some difference here, or that you're saying to me there's some difference here, given your independence that we in the legislative branch have granted you and the PAB, which we saw as no different from <laughs> the kind of, of, um, of, of application of the law that we would expect for other employees. Mrs. Norton, I wasn't suggesting that we treated these cases any differently than how they would have been treated by any other similar agency in the federal government. In fact, there were cases, as I pointed out earlier, that our office handled 12, but there were initially more cases, more individuals who filed charges challenging the restructuring decisions which again, I want to point out, is different from the GAO order concerning pay to some extent. I mean, there was, those were two separate processes. The three individuals who filed discrimination allegations concerning the restructuring were by virtue of the mechanism that is set forth in the PAB regulations and GAO orders were transferred, in effect, to the GAO's Office of Opportunity and Inclusiveness for investigation, and they're still there. So I don't, I, we did not take it upon ourselves to examine these claims for the determination as to whether reasonable grounds existed to believe that the restructuring process was discriminatory because that, those questions were to be addressed first at OOI, they can still come to the PAB once that process is completed. Or thank, they you, thank you, Ms. Wagner, and I understand this. I, that's why I asked you for the law. And I asked Mr. Corrin for the law, too. And frankly, it's black letter law, Ms. Wagner. Let me just ask both of you a, a final question. I'm not asking you anything that I think is outside of what you know. And I don't think saying what the black letter law is or that somebody settled it uh, you know, you settled the case too. Uh, I'm not saying why you settled it, you, the, the GAO, but you settled the case. 
uh, after looking at the law. Uh, I, I, let, let, let me ask both of you. Um, are you prepared to follow existing anti-discrimination law as it applies to other federal employees? Ab absolutely, I'm qualified. Ms. Yes, yes. Ms. Wagner. Yes, yes. That, that, that's really all I'm getting at. I want to yes. make sure that we, we're not still dealing with a, with a different standard in, 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 in the GAO. Fin my final question is, would either of you having, have any objection to the Speaker of the House, the Majority Leader of the Senate, uh, together with the Minority Leader of the House and the Minority Leader of the Senate, appointing the members of the PAB, uh, the General Counsel, uh, and the IG? Well, it's, that's certainly, uh, Representative Norton, within the purview and the best judgment of, of Congress uh, who should serve in such positions that are un under Congress. Uh, however, m my view is that the present system has worked extremely well because the employees are, are so integral to the selection process and the way the screening has taken place has been. You notice, Mr. Coran, that I have been at great lengths to say that I regarded both your work and uh, the work, PAB's work and Ms. Wagner's work to be um, above reproach during the, the controversy that's been before us. So I'm not indicating whether it's worked well or not. I asked, did you, would you object? Did you see any problem to these four members being the appointing authority? That's my only question. Okay. Uh, I, I certainly couldn't object to that. Ms. Wagner? I have no objection to that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, uh, yes. Mr. Norton. I have no further questions. And thank you all very much. third panel is um, going to consist of Mr. Curtis Copeland. Mr. Copeland is currently a specialist in American government at the Congressional Research Service, CRS, within the U.S. Library of Congress. His specific area of research expertise is federal rulemaking and regulatory policy. He is also head of the executive and judiciary section with the CRS Government and Finance Division. Copeland, thank you. Ms. Shirley Jones is the current president of the GAO Chapter of Blacks in Government. She was first elected president in 2005 and was re-elected January of 2007. Ms. Jones is Assistant General Counsel in the Office of General Counsel at the U.S. Government Accountability Office. In this role, she is responsible for supervising the legal support for the Strategic Issues SI Mission Team, work related to tax policy and administration. Ms. Jones, thank you. Ms. Janet Crenshaw Smith is co founder and president of Ivy Planning Group, an 18 year old management consultant and training company that specializes in diversity strategy and change management. Ms. Smith, thank you very much. Ms. Jacqueline Harp is on GAO's International Federation of Professional and Technical Engineers Interim Council. She is a senior analyst on GAO's education workforce and income security team. She has nearly 34 years of experience working at GAO. Thank you all for being here. And as you know, we swear all of our witnesses in. So if you will raise your right hand, do you solemnly swear that the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. The record will show that the witness has answered in the affirmative. Thank you all very much. And of course, you know that your testimony is 
included in the record if you would take five minutes and summarize the green light indicates that you've got the full five minutes going gets down to yellow you've got a minute left and of course red means that you have con concluded your testimony and thank you very much uh, dr. Copeland we'll begin with you thank you mr. chairman members of the subcommittee thank you for inviting me today I'm here to discuss several issues that CRS was asked to address related to the implementation of the new pay system under the GAO Human Capital Reform Act of 2004. The first such issue was whether the Comptroller General told Congress and GAO employees during consideration of the legislation that all employees who received a meets expectation performance evaluation would receive annual adjustments to their base pay. As I described in detail in my written statement and as I testified before the subcommittee last year, the record indicates that the Comptroller General gave such assurances in writing and orally on multiple occasions to both congressional committees and individual members of Congress. House and Senate committee reports on the legislation repeated the Comptroller General's commitments. GAO's employees' concerns about the legislation were reportedly assuaged by those assurances. And documents published before and after the statute's enactment that are still on GAO's website continue to indicate that, quote, all GAO employees who perform at a satisfactory level will receive an annual base pay adjustment, unquote. However, the record indicates that 308 GAO analysts and specialists did not receive the 2.6 percent permanent increase that other GAO employees received in January 2006. All of the 308 employees had meets expectations ratings or better on all relevant performance dimensions. In 2007, 138 GAO analysts and specialists with at least meets expectations ratings did not receive any of the 2.4 percent permanent pay increases provided to other GAO employees, and 66 others received only partial increases. Thirteen GAO administrative staff members with at least satisfactory ratings also did not receive the full 2007 pay increase. During the May 2007 hearing before this subcommittee, the Comptroller General said his decisions to withhold those annual pay increases were fully consistent with the authority provided him in the GAO Human Capital Reform Act. GAO told CRS that the Act permitted the Comptroller General to determine the size of the annual adjustments, including the option of providing no adjustment at all to some or all GAO employees. However, the General Counsel of the GAO Personnel Appeals Board testified at the May 2007 and repeated just now that the Comptroller General appeared to have exceeded his statutory authority. The General Counsel and a CRS attorney who also testified at, it at the May 2007 hearing testified that the legislative history of the Act indicated that Congress believed all GAO employees who met performance expectations would receive an annual pay adjustment. In February 2008, as a result of negotiations with union representatives, GAO agreed to provide all of its employees with a meets expectation rating at least the 4.49 percent increase that was provided to general schedule employees in the Washington, D.C. pay area. However, this action does not restore the salaries or income lost by the employees who did not receive the 2006 or 2007 annual adjustments. For example, a table in my testimony illustrates uh, because those two adjustments were not provided, a GAO employee who was making 110000 a year in 2005 who was placed in band 2A, which is roughly a grade 13 in uh, general schedule, will have foregone a total of more than $14,000 in base pay increases by the end of 2008. If that employee then retires under the civil service retirement system, her pension will be nearly $2,700 a year lower than if she had received the 2006 and 2007 adjustments. Therefore, after a 20-year retirement, the employee will have foregone nearly $68,000 in wages and pensions since 2005. A variety of factors can influence the size of the wage and pension differential, including the employee's starting salary, whether the PBC is provided as base pay, and whether the employee receives an annual increase in one year or the next. Mr. Chairman, that concludes my prepared statement. I'd be happy to answer any questions. We will proceed to Ms. Scott. Mr. Chairman and Representative Norton, I am pleased to be here today to discuss the results of the survey that you requested on the Band 2 restructuring and the Watson Wyatt market based compensation study. My name is Shirley Jones, and I am an assistant general counsel at GAO. 
I had the opportunity to testify before you last November in my capacity as president of the GAO USACE chapter of blacks in government to share the concerns that our chapter had previously raised regarding the impact of the Bantu restructuring on African American staff in particular. In addition to being big chapter president, for the last four years, I have also served as the attorney's representative to the Employee Advisory Council. And since your hearing last May, I have worked with the EAC committee that conducted this survey. I will highlight just a few points. The survey was sent to all GAO employees except SES and interns. 71% of eligible employees responded. To provide a picture of those responding, demographic questions were asked regarding position, years at GAO, age, race, ethnicity, sex, and location. Not surprisingly, the highest area of non-response to the demographic questions was in the answer to the question about race identification. In addition, the highest non-response to the survey itself was from Asian and African American employees. Several survey questions asked about staff involvement, input, and transparency with regard to the Watson Wide study. Starting with the Watson Wide focus groups, 19% of administrative professional and support staff reported participating compared to only 4% of analysts and 8% of attorneys. Only 4% of those responding reported being interviewed by Watson Wyatt for the study. Of particular note, no band one or band two respondents reported being interviewed by Watson Wyatt. A much higher number of staff, 94%, reported that they listened to CG chats or attended town hall meetings. An overwhelming majority, 81% of respondents reported that they felt they were only slightly involved or not at all involved in providing input to management on the transition to market-based pay. Similarly, 81% also felt that employee input was ultimately only slightly or not at all considered. A majority of those responding had concerns with the level of transparency of the Watson Wise study and the GAO decision making process. We also asked about satisfaction with GAO's market based pay system. There were notice notable differences based on position, age, and race. Band 2As and Band 2Bs, respondents aged 40 and over, and African Americans had higher percentages of respondents who said they were generally or very dissatisfied with GAO's market-based pay system. 81% of respondents thought morale in general was worse or much worse now than before the transition. 48% responded that their own morale was worse or much worse now. A higher percentage of respondents age 40 and over and African Americans reported that their morale was worse or much worse. Turning to the restructuring of Band 2 and to a Band 2A and Band 2B, 54% of respondents disagreed or strongly disagreed with the restructuring, while 29% strongly agreed or, or agreed. Certain demographics disagreed or strongly disagreed at a higher rate. African Americans, again, Band 2A staff, those at GAO 10 years or longer, and employees 40 years or older. Regarding the current general climate at GAO, lower percentages of band two analysts and administrative professional and support staff, 33% and 38% respectively, felt their professional contributions at GAO were highly or very highly valued compared to attorneys and band three staff with that rate at 67% and 63% respectively. A lower percentage of respondents with 10 or more years of service and respondents age 40 and older felt that their contributions were highly valued. A lower percentage of African Americans, only 27% compared to other racial groups, felt that their contributions were highly valued. 1,113 survey respondents provided substantive narrative comments at the end of the survey, which we coded into 29 categories. Although not generalizable to the overall GAO population, we noted that more than twice as many respondents specifically commented that the Band 2 restructuring was damaging to employee morale 
or otherwise provided disincentives than those that responded that it was, it was the right thing to do, 217 compared to 74. 133 respondents commented that GAO's pay for performance system is damaging to employee morale or otherwise provides disincentives, while 80 respondents said that they believe that PFP at GAO is helpful or worthwhile. 108 respondents noted their belief that PFP ratings are inaccurate. 107 respondents noted their belief that GAO employees should receive, receive the same cost of living adjustment as employees at executive branch agency. Staff also used the narrative comments to express other concerns, such as GAO losing talented staff because of the recent changes, GAO's overall processes being discriminatory, lack of trust overall, locality pay decisions being flawed, concerns about the lack of domestic partner benefits, and concerns about the treatment of communications analyst positions under, re under the restructuring. It is important to note that some narrative comments conveyed positive thoughts, including the belief that the Comptroller General should be given credit for moving the agency in the right direction, that GAO has excellent benefits, and that our work is cutting edge. In conclusion, I would like to end with a personal observation having served on the EAC for over four years. From my perspective, it wasn't surprising that Band 2A staff reported more unfavorable responses, particularly as it relates to the compensation ranges and the Band 2 restructuring. It's also not surprising that African American staff generally had less favorable responses since we know that African American staff had expressed concerns with the disparities in appraisal scores leading up to the restructuring. But more than just confirming what was perhaps the obvious, it is notable that staff at all levels and in all positions, not just Band 2A and not just African American staff, expressed concerns about transparency levels, the restructuring, COLAs, and locality pay decisions. Having worked on the content analysis myself, it was striking to me that while more Band 3 staff responded that they felt their own personal contributions were highly or very highly valued compared to Band 2A staff, Band 3 staff were also among those who shared concerns with the PFP system and the Band 2 restructuring providing disincentives or otherwise being damaging to, to morale or that the PFP ratings are inaccurate. It is clear from the survey's high response rate and the voluminous narrative comments that staff at all levels and in all positions and of all races, that they appreciated the subcommittee's interest and the opportunities to share their thoughts, both positive and negative, with you directly. On their behalf, I thank you. This concludes my statement, and I am happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, Ms. Jones. Uh, Ms. Smith. Chairman Davis and members of the subcommittee, I am pleased to be here today to discuss the U.S. Government Accountability Office African American and Caucasian Analyst Performance Assessment Study, Tasks 1 and 2. My name is Janet Crenshaw-Smith, and I am president of Ivy Planning Group. In 2002, GAO issued a solicitation seeking a third-party assessment of the factors influencing the performance rating average differences between African American and Caucasian analysts. Ivy Planning Group was retained by GAO as the prime contractor for this contract. SRA International is a subcontractor to Ivy. This project was divided into three tasks. We have completed the first two. Task one is an analysis of 2002 to 2006 performance data for African American and Caucasian analysts. The purpose of this task is to confirm that there were differences between the ratings of African American and Caucasian analysts. The Ivy team performed a statistical analysis to determine if there are significant differences in the performance ratings of the two groups. Task two is an assessment and comparison of abilities, education, engagement roles, and performance of new GAO analyst hires and onboard employees rated from 2002 to 2006. 
The purpose of this task is to determine if African American analysts and Caucasian analysts have the same abilities and backgrounds when they arrive at GAO and to begin to look at what happens to them during their tenure at GAO. The IV team evaluated key characteristics to determine if both groups are equal at time of hire, controlled statistically for differences in education, experience, key roles and gender, assessed radar demographics on outcomes, and reviewed human capital processes for consistency with agency goals. Task three is an assessment of internal and external best practices in implementing performance management systems and preparation of a final report that brings task one, two, and three together. Task three involved looking at best practices in the private sector, the federal sector, and within GAO, collecting qualitative data from African American and Caucasian analysts and raters at GAO, and presenting our overall recommendations to GAO. We are scheduled to present our final report at the end of next month. I will discuss tasks one and two today. However, as the project is really the culmination of all three tasks, I look forward to having the opportunity to return to discuss with you task three and, fin and the final report, and particularly Ivy's recommendations in the future. I will report where we are in the project, highlighting, highlighting a few points around what we have learned thus far. First, yes, there are differences in ratings between African American analysts and Caucasian analysts in general. Also, by competency, pay band, team, location, and regardless of the race of the rater, and the differences are statistically significant. There are some differences between African American analysts and Caucasian analysts at their time of hire. They come from different schools and proportionally do not have the same level of education. Please note that our data on school and degree are based on the highest degree earned by the analyst and that while most analysts earned their highest degrees prior to being hired, some analysts may have earned their highest degree after joining GAA, GAO. We also learned that the same factor impacts African American analysts and Caucasian analyst ratings differently. For example, having a PhD has a statistically significant positive effect for Caucasian analysts, but no effect for African American analysts. Caucasian analysts receive a ratings benefit from being assigned to high-risk projects compared to African-American analysts who receive no statistically significant effect of having been assigned to a high-risk project. African-American analysts with some college but no degree receive no stati statistically significant negative ratings correlation compared with Caucasian analysts with some college but no degree who do. The final report will provide our full synthesis and analysis of the data in the context of our overall findings and more importantly, our, recommend our recommendations to mitigate these differences. I look forward to continuing the open communication with you and your staff and reporting those findings. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you very much, Ms. Smith, and uh, we will proceed to Ms. Hart. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman and Ms. Norton and members of the subcommittee, my name is Jacqueline Harp and I am a senior analyst on GAO's Education Workforce and Income Security Team. I am also a representative of GAO's newly elected union, including a bargaining unit of about 1,900 employees affiliated with the International Federation of Professional and Technical Engineers, IFPTE. I am pleased to be here today to discuss GAO reforms and the impact on staff of human capital transformation efforts, such as the restructuring of one pay ban under pay for performance, changes to employee classification and compensation using a market-based pay study, and proposed legislation that is before the Congress today, 
referred to as the Government Accountability Office Act of 2007. Over the past two years, GAO employees have experienced major changes in the way we do our work and how we are compensated. The restructuring of Payband 2 analysts and the use of a market-based pay study have led to charges of unfair treatment as federal employees with respect to pay and discrimination based on race and age in job classification and pay. While GAO employees continue to have a tremendous respect for the agency and the service GAO brings to the Congress and the American people, GAO's analysts have formed GAO's first bargaining unit to address our concerns, and now we have a way to ensure that our concerns are heard and actions are taken. A summary of our major concerns are, GAO employees' pay should be on par with that of other federal employees. Employees' purchasing power should be protected, particularly since this has been a long-standing promise and a key selling point for the Pay for Performance Initiative. Major changes in personnel systems should be assessed to ensure that employees or groups of employees are not harmed by the use of criteria that would put them at a distinct disadvantage. GAO has a long history that show disparities in performance appraisals of African Americans and job leadership opportunities have varied widely for all staff. Yet these two criteria were central to restructuring positions and pay of about 800 employees leading to charges of discrimination based on race and prohibited personnel practices because employees believed they had been demoted without cause. We applaud GAO's efforts to examine the reasons for disparities in ratings, and we look forward to a briefing on the results of the study. We appreciate and endorse the legislation proposed to remedy concerns raised with GAO's implementation of its new authorities, pay parity and protection of employees' purchasing power. The minimum requirement of a floor guarantee to ensure pay parity will be very helpful as the GAO employees organization and GAO management bargain for future negotiated pay agreements. We endorse retroactive compensation to those employees denied full annual pay adjustments in 2006 and 2007, as provided in this legislation. And we would ask, Mr. Chairman, that pending employee grievances or discrimination complaints involving issues in addition to or other than the denial of past annual adjustments be held harmless in this legislation. We also support the legislative provision for a statutory inspector general, along with requirements to ensure independence of the inspector general, the Office of Opportunity and Inclusiveness, and the Personnel Appeals Board. The GAO Employees Organization stands ready to work with GAO management to ensure that the needs of the agency, the Congress, and the American people are met. We appreciate the opportunity to testify before you today and look forward to working with you to help ensure that GAO continues to improve its transparency, employee communications, as well as its pay and performance management systems. Mr. Chairman, I want to thank the members of this subcommittee, other members of Congress, and your staff for the support you have provided GAO employees from the time the first person contacted you about individual concerns over two years ago through the entire unionizing efforts. Members of this committee and others made it clear that our rights to organize would be protected, and for that we are especially grateful. We appreciate the members and staff who were empathetic to our concerns and did not brush us aside as just a few disgruntled staff. Today is an historic occasion for GAO employees since it is the first time a member 
of GAO's newly formed union is testifying before a congressional committee. This concludes my statement, and I will be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, and I want to thank each one of you for your testimony. Uh, Mr. Copeland, let me ask you, um, you've testified before the subcommittee regarding the personnel reforms and ban to restructuring at the General Accountability Office. In your opinion, would the lump sum payments and the pension changes in my draft legislation make whole the GAO employees who met expectations but did not receive their annual across the board increases in 2006 and 7. Mr. Chairman, I'd first like to point out that CRS doesn't take a position on any legislation, but technically I have reviewed it and it appears that in general the, uh, the lump sum payments and the uh, pay adjustment provisions would in general make those employees whole vis-a-vis -vis other GAO employees who had their PBC as, uh, annual, as, as, bo as bonus payments from those years. That's correct. Also, let me ask you, if GAO employees receive the floor guarantee in the future, which is similar to what GAO and the union agreed to implement this year, what impact do you think it would have on GAO's overall performance-based compensation program? Uh, in 2006 and 2007, GAO funded the performance-based compensation program in part by reducing the, the size of the annual adjustments. And so if the annual adjustments are provided on par with the GS increases, then the amount of funds available for performance-based compensation would be less, which means that either the performance-based compensation bonuses would become less, uh, fewer people would receive them, or both. In H.R. 3268, GAO included a provision that would remove the current executive four, level four cap and allow GAO employees to be paid up to executive level three. As a result, non-SES GAO employees' maximum salary would go from $149,000 to $158,000. What do you think of this provision? Uh, I would note that the uh, executive level four cap of currently affects GS employees in, um, in 12 locality pay areas across the government. So GAO is not the only uh, agency that is affected by the executive level four cap. Uh, and in next year, uh, if current trends continue, then five more pay areas will be covered. Uh, if GAO is granted this relief, then it's likely that other agencies will seek similar types of relief. Thank you very much. Um, Ms. Jones, um, I thank you for your testimony. And let me ask you, what was the survey response and how many respondents took the time to write comments for the open-ended survey questions and how meaningful are the survey response rates? The overall survey response rate was 71%, which is almost identical to the survey response rate for GAO's employee feedback survey. Um, and we consider that a very good response rate, especially considering employees' previous concerns with survey confidentiality. We had 1,113 respondents to actually provide narrative comments to the open-ended question. And having been a part of the two-person team that did the content analysis, I can <laughs> tell you that they were voluminous. <laughs> and they were indeed thoughtful and considerate of the issues going on at GAO. And I would even characterize many of them as passionate. It was clear to me in reading them that they really wanted the Congress to hear their concerns. Um, in your opinion, why was there a higher non-response rate for Asian and African American employees? Um, well, as I mentioned in my testimony, my oral testimony, I wasn't surprised at that fact at all. 
as I mentioned a few moments ago, there have, have been previous concerns with survey confidentiality um, across the board at GAO, but that concern is always heightened for minority staff because generally there are fewer of them on the team. And so there's the concern that they can more readily be identified personally. And so often they choose to not respond to surveys at all or they choose not to respond to the demographic question. Are you saying that in your experiences that minority staff have a tendency to have a higher level of concern about yeah. retribution? Yes. And, and that may mitigate against revealing information. Right. I, b I believe that to be true. And even though in our um, testimony, our full written statement and the product that we pre previously supplied to your staff, we noted concerns with underrepresentation of the staff and we noted concerns with the missing demographic information. However, since our response rate is essentially identical to the employee feedback survey response rate, I'm not sure, I have no evidence that is any different for our survey than it is for any other survey at GAO or for that matter any survey at another agency. I think that's a concern that is across the board with minority staff that they can be personally identified and in some instances they fear retribution and retaliation. Um, how do you reconcile the majority negative comments to the survey with the previous high marks on the GAO employee feedback survey that in 2007 led to GAO being second place on the best place to work survey? I think GAO staff are very honest. I think they answer questions with integrity. They can give credit when credit is due and when there are concerns they can provide negative feedback. I think that was the case with our survey. We asked we touched a nerve, so to speak, by asking questions about very sensitive topics such as the Bantu restructuring and the PFP system and, and the, the lack of COLAs. And the staff stood up and expressed their concerns about those issues. On the other hand, the Best Places to Work survey has a much more limited focus and essentially asked, considering everything, how satisfied are you with your job? And GAO is, they are very satisfied with the work. They feel that they are providing a great service to the Congress and to the taxpayer. So it is clear that on the one hand, they could be very satisfied with their job, but still have very serious concerns with the Bantu restructuring and with the loss of COLAs and with the PFP system. Thank you very much. Um, Ms. Smith, let me ask you, uh, uh, the Ivy Group um, consulting training company that specializes in diversity strategy and change management, management, would you recommend an agency implement personnel reforms that would impact employees' promotions and pay if it had evidence of rating disparities based on race? Well, Mr. Chairman, we, are, we will be making our recommendations next month after we have fully synthesized the information. Um, but certainly, if we find that there are differences that we can attribute to, to race um, that are unfair, we will make recommendations to the agencies to address any of those disparities. And those findings would then obviously at least raise a red flag in your mind or in the mind of you and your colleagues. Can you repeat the question, please? If you found such disparities, mm -hmm. uh, would they at the very least raise what I will call a red flag in the minds of you and your colleagues? Well, in task one and task two, 
we have already found that there are differences in the performance ratings of African American analysts and Caucasian analysts. However, we have not found answers to the why. In fact, the data can say that there's a difference. The data doesn't necessarily explain the differences. So our recommendations can address those differences in performance ratings without necessarily understanding why the differences exist. Would you uh, view that information as certainly being helpful and directive for management um, as it continues to program and make decisions? I do, I do believe that our recommendations will be helpful to, to management and to the analysts in terms of assisting them in their career, their transition, and actually delivering the work. Thank you very much. Um, Ms. Harp, let me ask you, um, the subcommittee staff has been working on pay adjustment provisions for FY6 and 7 for GAO employees who met expectations but did not receive an across-the-board adjustment for those two years. What are your views on the retroactive provision that we've included in the legislation that I'm introducing, and do you think it will effectively address the problem? Mr. Chairman, while we believe that a full remedy would have been to include the across-the-board increase uh, that staff had in addition to the performance-based pay uh, that they have received, we feel that the retroactive provision provided in the legislation represents a compromise that will provide additional compensation to our employees now and in the future, and we support it and thank you for um, providing that to the employees. Our understanding in the legislation also is that um, uh, it will not affect any outstanding claims that GAO employees have that uh, relate to discrimination and or uh, placements or promotions that uh, have uh, been included in these claims. And so employees uh, are, are happy to support the legislation. Thank you very much. And let me ask you, what, what are your views on the across-the-board floor guarantee? We support the floor guarantee. We feel that uh, this concept gives us a minimum threshold to ensure that GAO employees through a combination of GAO across the board and increase in performance-based pay uh, will receive the percentage of their um, salary that um, many federal employees received um, just by coming to work every day. So we are are very pleased with the floor guarantee in that it ensures that everyone who performs satisfactorily at GAO, uh, which is a high standard, will have their purchasing power uh, not eroded as uh, was the case with management decisions made in uh, 06 and 07. Do you have the same feeling uh, that was expressed with the hope that it might put to rest um, the anxiety or controversy surrounding whether or not individuals can simply expect with a tremendous amount of reliability that if they meet expectations that they will and shall indeed receive their cost of living adjustment. Yes, sir, Mr. Chairman. We um, do believe that will go a long way to relieving the anxiety of, of staff because in the past um, with the Comptroller General's discretion as to uh, how uh, he would divide the uh, pot of money for uh, pay, um, staff were concerned uh, particularly with the ranges, pay ranges where some staff would not uh, be 
subject to getting any across the board. So this will greatly assist staff and relieve their anxiety. Well, let me thank all of you um, for your participation as well as your patience. Um, our hearings uh, seem to be getting longer and longer. <laughs> and um, it requires a amount of patience to be a part of them. But we certainly thank you. And um, we look forward to seeing you again soon. And this meeting is adjourned.